one William Blake. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. A oh, very wonderful talk. I love the way that the compasses, you know, if they fell over, they fall onto the diagram. And so the world that um, Newton created, he created. I thought that was a very beautiful image. I wonder if I could ask you about the naming of this image as Newton. It's one of the 12 color plates, but why is it known as Newton? Um, you, you, you've asked me a question, the specifics I don't know. I don't know where the title came from because there's not all that much around about why Blake made these print paintings, is there? Or who he made them for, if anyone, or who he sold them to. So it's called Newton. Do you know where the title came from, Tim? I wonder if you do or anyone else does. Um, I believe on the back of one of the prints, someone has written, oh. but it's not in Blake's hand. Okay. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know that. So it's coming about by circuitous means, like the title of the Ancient of Days also is, is yeah, comes from elsewhere, but that time from Blake, um, just not applied to the Europe frontispiece. Um, so that's interesting. So why I don't know enough about contemporary representations of Newton in print to know that there would have been any direct visual analog. Um, and I have been just thinking a lot about the association of Newton with geometry notwithstanding the fact that he wasn't that geometrical a mathematician, and also the association of Newton with mechanics that's coming to Blake through Berkeley. But you're unsettling, uh, in my mind, that initial presumed identification, which I think is very interesting. I mean, one of the things that, that did strike me um, about this print because I've only, I think about Blake's audience quite a lot and I'm sure we all do because um, it's kind of one of the vexations and interests of his work and, and him. So the this Newton print painting goes to Butts, doesn't it, in 1805. Um, so I was also thinking about that verse contained in the letter to Butts from Falpham that talks about single vision and Newton's sleep. Um, now, I don't know of anyone having explored the relationship between Blake Butts and Newton. Um, somebody on this Zoom call might know, but I don't. Um, so that's something else that just struck me as an interesting kind of incidence. You pointed out that the difference between the 1795 monoprints and the 1805 monoprints is the diagram doesn't exist in the earlier one. Did I get that correct? Yes. Yeah, you did. Um, and as we'll all know, um, it yeah, when you go on the Blake archive, you can look at these side by side. So you, the diagram appears in. Um, well, people have argued for different dates of this second Newton print, which is another thing that intrigues me, um, and argue too that it might be the third, the, the third pull, but the second extant from that particular um, outline painting. Um, but uh, the, as well as the diagram not being there in the earlier print, there's a lot less detail, isn't there? Because all of the, yeah, the Coraline and, and the forms and the anemones come in that second version. 
can I push you a little more on the accreditation to Newton? That the 12 large colour prints, perhaps you might say a little bit about how they were made for everyone who may not be familiar with them, but most of them are from the Bible or perhaps from Shakespeare like Hecate or Pity, but they could all come from the Bible. And so Newton does seem the odd one out. Okay, so yeah, I like this line of questioning and I don't know the, I'd, so I haven't thought about this before and I've just, the connection of Newton, with Newton has just, has just worked for me. Um, Newton's not entirely a negative figure, is he? Because he sounds the trump of the apocalypse in Europe. And I, again, I, 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 don't, I don't know if, I don't think this meets your question quite, but I arrived at this by thinking about how Blake seems to formulate a theory of line in connection to comments about Newton in a really strange way. Um, so his, the comments about Newton he makes um, outside the ones where he talks about him and, and Locke and Bacon together, um, he associates him with black outline, with the line of Job, which is itself not intermeasurable with or by anything else. Um, he talks about Newton's calculation. He talks about Newton's experimentation too. Um, but I have, I am puzzling at some thinking about Newtonian and Newton in relation to geometrical line um, in connection to Blake's own emergent theories of outline, um, which I suppose come most strongly in 1809. Um, in terms of how Blake made these uh, print paintings, um, so he's in, he's said to have taken um, millboard, isn't he? And then to have painted outlines on those and then have blotted paint onto the outlines and then to have pressed damp wove paper on top by means of his rolling press, which transferred with that element of felicity that I find interesting, um, the paint onto the paper, which he then kind of worked at the blots and blurs, um, pointing detail with watercolour and then in 1805 with pen and ink. And there's wonderful writing about that process, which gets some of the details slightly wrong, as I recall, um, in terms of, um, I don't know, the use of glue and various other materials. Um, but Tatum writes about that process really interestingly because he's so interested in the accidentality of the process and how there's a kind of a brink, brinksmanship, it's slightly beyond Blake's control, um, which I find a very attractive um, idea, something that Blake's experimenting with. Um. Accidentality is a wonderful word and um, his method of monoprints means there were, if I've got it right, there were never more than three. That's right. Uh, versions, free pools of any one image, whether it was in 1795 or 1805. So they were very limited and each one different, as you point out. Do you think, when you look at the first version of Newton, that it, that it might have come from the Bible? I haven't, no, I haven't thought about that. So I, I, having confessed my ignorance, I would be really interested to hear more from you about the connection that you might have in mind, if there is one. Um, I, I don't wish to subvert your talk, but I was reading the Bible the other day and I was looking at Proverbs, the book mm -hmm. of Proverbs, and I was looking at um, verse 8, 27, chapter 8, verse 27 of Proverbs. And it has two significant lines. It says, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. And then it goes on to the next line. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. So it's that line, when he set a compass upon the face of the depth. 
you've got that very striking image that would have touched Blake. You know, the, the Bible was a landscape he inhabited. And it seems such a strong connection to what we now know as Newton. And of course, it, it's so um, attractive to attach the name Newton to this naked figure at the bottom of an ocean. But do you think it might be like the other 12 images from the large color prints? Actually, a quote from the Bible that we've later attributed to Newton because it's so seductive to depict Newton in such a way. I don't know because you're rooting it through that connection is often used in relation to the frontispiece of Europe, where you have more evidently a demiurge reaching down with the compasses. And that's the image that recalls more the frontispiece to Mott's Principia, just a bit more because of the planet circulating that kind of bearded figure. And I think I would say, why then are the compasses not on the face of the deep? Why are they on this diagram on the scroll? I mean, is it more enabling for your reading, the 1795 image without the diagram? Perhaps, but what, why then the scroll? Why do you have a scroll rather than the... Um, it, is it a globe? Is it a kind of a burning globe? I wish I had Europe before my eyes, the frontispiece. Do you recall? Uh, I don't. Somebody will. Somebody will know. Many people on this call will have it in their mind. So I'm, if, why is there a diagram if it's not Newton? Why is there a scroll? Because there's something kind of scholarly in that act of attention. And I, I'm not, I'm not disputing the, well, I suppose there are lots of origins of that image, but I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't dispute at all that scriptural thread that you're tracing. I just, I don't think I would prioritize it over the others because, I mean, what do you make of the Euclid Archimedes connection that the mathematician bending down attentively? Did, did that, do you think that rivals? I think it's wonderful. I, I haven't looked at Euclid since I was about eight years old at school and I imagine many people in the audience today were first exposed to Euclid in those, you know, that past mathematical teachings in our schools. So I think it was a wonderful um, exposition of the image, Sarah. So thank you very much indeed. Should we open it up to questions from our audience? So because there are many people in the audience, is what I'm going to do is um, remove my spotlight and open it up to questions. So it's going to be a bit of discipline here. Who would like to ask a question? And if you speak, then we should know who you are. I guess I would like to ask a question. Do you name yourself, please? Yes. <laughs> I'm Neil Romanek. Um, and thank you very much, Sarah. That was that was really wonderful. Um, <clears throat> I just thought maybe get your your comments on something that popped out to me. Um, and people have probably brought up the idea that the compass as being very kind of a Masonic almost symbol. Um, but then also what pops out to me is that um, scroll is not much of a scroll and that it looks like it's the top of a of an ionic column turned over is one of the things that really pops out to me like it's an inverted it looks like marble doesn't it um and it it it's almost like a you know if you took it at an ionic cotton i think it's ionic whichever one um you know and inverted it um and it really strikes me that that looks like a piece of, of marble or stone and not and not a scroll not doesn't look like it's supposed to be paper at all which is it was a is a fascinating contrast with all the the earth and then the the stone and the coral on the opposite side of it which kind of becomes this very architectural thing on the bottom there and also his, his fingers are quite strange in that I, I don't know if there's anything in the the fingers seem very deliberately 
you know, artificial in terms of how they're pointing and how they're, they're gesturing there. I think those are two things that or, or a couple of things that really popped out at me there. I don't know if you have any comments on that or thoughts. That's really fascinating. And it's very enabling to think of that scroll as a column. I mean, I, I suppose you still have the projective plastic if the compass is moving. I found that I find that connection between folding paper and something three-dimensional and sculptural, a really interesting way of thinking about the image because of how it relates to, and some of you might have thought of this, to the origin of painting in Pliny's natural history. So you have the, it's a kind of a double or triple origin of painting where somebody draws around the outline of a face, but there's also Butardi's daughter who both draws around the outline of her beloved and fills it with clay. And then her potter father makes, as far as I recall, makes the sculptural image. So I, I was interested in that toggling already in the, in the history of painting. Now, thinking about a column, thinking about stonemasonry and some of the, the audience, the, art, the artisan audience of a lot of these practical geometrical textbooks, um, that would be really interesting to, pursue um, because these textbooks the ones that really interest me like the ones by Bonnie Castle and Thomas Moulton too they're interested in teaching artisans how to do stuff and measure stuff but they're also interested in teaching Euclidean demonstration and proof even to, even to mechanics you know so but a lot of these textbooks are also about kind of bodging things together using your compass um, so yeah, practically thinking about stonework would be really, would be really interesting, and makes me want to look look at Blake's other scrolls too to see if there's anything papery in the look of any of them at all. But um, sorry, that was a bit of a, a deluge of talk. I don't know if that met your question all right. Hope it did. No, that was great. I was, yeah, I just wanted to hear just to get what your thoughts were on that. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Uh, Tim, could I uh, ask Sarah a question? Please, Colin. Thanks. Uh, Colin Addy, Sarah, thanks very much for the, uh, for the talk. Um, it, it, um, it made me look at uh, the picture much more um, sort of intensely than I've done for a long time. And I tend to like to look at Blake as, a, as uh, his, his, art, his works in terms of what they're depicting in the art. Um, and, and, and the images. And it suddenly struck me halfway through what you were telling us, um, which you, I don't know if it's possible to go back to a picture of Newton, but it's really, uh, no, sorry, it's not it really. It is also a, um, uh, a, a study of triangles. It's not just the triangle that is um, the compass or the um, triangle on the scroll, but his fingers are triangles, his wrist is a triangle, there's a double triangle between hand and leg. There's triangles under the uh, calf muscles. Um, the rock is a triangle. There's lots of stuff going on there. Now I wonder, is this, this could be subconscious maybe, the artist being subconscious, Blake drawing triangles. Um, he could be playful, he could be trying to tell us something. I don't know, have you any thoughts on that? Sorry, everybody, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, it, it's me or the Blake, which is really wrong because we might just look at the Blake. Um, if, you, if you're able to get, get, up, get it up on your own screens, then do. Let me see if I can go back to it now I'm no longer muted. Uh, I th all I'm gonna say after all that um, talk was, yes, <laughs> yeah, study in triangles. So I, th I mean, Donald Dalt, if, anyone, if any of you have read visionary physics it's just the most fantastic book and it opens with a wonderful reading of, of this image and for him it's about the and I quoted it the math the kind of the the figure being the, the body being lured into a parody of the diagram I mean I think the, the triangles with with the fingers and the form come initially in 1795 so they're coming from the compass but you still have a sense of that finger as a as a manicule, which makes me think of diagrams always, that pointing yeah. finger. Um, but I think the thing that always, 
there's something grim about this image and something static, but there's also an immense concentration of energy, right? And and I just, the idea of the figure just being lured into a, the human figure being lured into a parody of the linear figure doesn't, isn't energetic enough for me. What do you, what do you, what do you think, Colin? What, what, what do you make of the triangle? Well, um, it, it's, it's only just something that's just suddenly occurred to me. Um, the whole thing, the whole picture, the whole image is a series of triangles. Um, now I'm sure that I'm sure that's you know very very sort of um, superficial and uh, and and maybe not uh, and maybe not have a great any, any great depth to the meaning of that, but uh, but I'm sort of just curious as to whether Blake was playing with triangles in 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 this uh, in this image. Um, he obviously was depicting something he wanted to um, to 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 draw to 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 portray, but it's all come out in triangles. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to rack my brains to think whether triangles feature much or any other ge ge geometric um, uh, shape features, particularly in any of the other works. I, I, I somehow don't think it does. It, they, they all seem to be more sinuous and more sort of flowing, whereas this one has got a, a, an awful, well, th particularly this one has got an awful lot of sort of um, uh, triangles in it, and they, they tend to be... Uh, um, fairly sort of equilateral, those kind of triangles, don't they, when you look at them. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect it might be subconscious. I, yeah, who knows? <laughs> who knows? I mean, I think yeah. <laughs> I, I'm tempted to, I'm tempted to see motivation here, but there's, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. That question of, that's a good question. I don't know if it, if, it comes to anyone else's mind how many others of Blake's designs we might think of as being geometrical. Mm. Um, if we absent from that, those cases where he's drawn in a border. I mean, I was interested, I, I was also thinking about diagrams and how his images are and aren't diagrams. So if you start that off literally, you'll see things like the mundane egg. But I was also thinking about those kind of emblematic borders of some of the Job plates mm. as kind of mm. uh, diagrams um mm. but yeah i don't know I, thank you for the question I just, don't, just a thought yeah, yeah um i'm gonna i think i might keep on flitting between um well i don't mind actually T tim are you able to see enough people tim to to take I, questions I'm just or? Going to invite would another person um speak a question please could i add to both comments um, because what intrigues me in this painting is um, the drapery that falls down from Newton and it turns into what we um, regard as the scroll and then it petrifies into uh, what um, Neil said to be a column. So uh, he is drawing on it and what he draws actually is a parody or intimation of what is around him, but he cannot focus on all of them. And he can only focus on the single vision he sees in front of him. And the drapery, I think, is not dropping off his shoulders, but from his mind. So slowly it turns into a material thing for him to draw upon. Uh, it's uh, much like Eurasen's, um net of religion and science maybe. It could be. These are the things I, I have been thinking about while you were t talking. Uh, that's interesting. So, so is it is it is it something about the petrification or reification of something that's more creative, or is it is there something enabling about the turning into inscribable stuff? I think for Blake, uh, petrification is always um, mm -mm. negative. So um, in this sense here, Newton's drawing upon this uh, scroll or it turning into a column. I think it looks like a column, yes. Um, means that he is slowly turning what he sees around it into material objects while the world around him or the coral reef underneath him is lively and without any um, geometrical uh, objects. He turns 
what he sees in his own body, the triangle in his hand, the triangles uh, that his body forms into things that he thinks he can see. That might be something that's happening. No, I love, I love that reading. Um, I suppose also, yeah, all, all those passages about minute particulars hardened into grains of sand. Idea of, of kind of the visionary opening up of even the smallest thing, but also the idea that everything is a, is a man. Um, that, but I love, I love that interpretation. Thank you. Thanks. Another question, please. Sarah, I'm P Peter Dodd here. If I can just bar barge in at the stage. Good evening to you. Um, I'd, I'd like to seek your opinion um, as to my own view of the picture of Newton, uh, which the representation of Newton is absolutely nothing uh, like any of the paintings that are known of him. Um, he was hardly a, an Arnold Schwarzenegger or a uh, figure, but it, it, here we have um, a, an idealized form of a man who is reticulated, covered in a network of a cage. He's, he is bounded, not by normal musculature, but by this reticulation that Blake has put there. The body looks like, pen, to me, like pentelic marble. And also, he has used, at the end of the scroll, uh, the volute, which you see on ionic columns, uh, also called the logarithmic spiral or the Fibonacci spiral. So I look at this not as a representation of Blake's view of Newton, but as Blake's view of the sciences, which the 18th century and Blake and the turn of the 19th century inherited from the Greeks. And I take this as Blake's polemic against Greek science. May I have your opinion on that? Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good reading. Obvious, I mean, obviously, but it that sound. Um, I always find it difficult to work out how far I'd make a case for Blake thinking something, and how far I realize I'm overlaying my own interpretation. Criticism of the Greek. The thing is. I think, I think the only thing I can add and seek to persuade you of, in addition to your suggestions, is something like what's a, a kind of a reassessment of Euclidean geometry by a writer like Thomas Beddoes. So, and, and all the practical geometers including John Bonnycastle, thinking about the origins of Greek geometry in practice rather than in pure thinking. Um, and it always reminds me of that kind of popular antiquarian impulse in works like Descriptive Catalogue, where Blake is interested in recovering art to its early originals. And I realised that among the many things that might be objectionable in what I'm suggesting is I don't know how much we think of Blake um, in this call now, think of Blake as an artist of mind and pure thinking and, and or how much we think of him as more of a practical artist. Um, so I think of him as a, an artist mediating between practice and pure thinking all the time. Um, and I, I certainly uh, want myself to interpret some positive 
reassessment of the practical element of Euclidean geometry such that others of Blake's contemporaries saw. Um, but there's something, there's an intricacy in my own reading and a, and a kind of a, a soundness in yours. So I'm not trying to displace the reading that you're suggesting, actually. Um, uh, do, yeah. But I don't, I mean, do you, do you see anything about geometry here? Or are you just, are you thinking, of, and I, I guess I'm saying, what do you mean by the, the sciences? The Greek sciences. And how I take, uh, how I take see, my reading of Blake's work, I'm sure he'd punch me on the nose if he were here and disagree with me. Um, but it looks, it feels, it looks and it smells to me as though Blake is endeavouring to transmit his ideas onto the print of reason, of sensation, of feeling, um, and of endeavouring to get the whole thing down at once, rather than taking it as an analysis. For me, the painting has an, or the print has an overwhelming smell of communication. And I, my reading of it is Blake is trying to tell me something as to how he views applied science. Um, and Blake, uh, from what I know, um, wasn't tremendously well informed as to Newton in as much as uh, there were aspects of Newton which only turned up about 150 years, probably after Blake's death, that Newton was very much involved in. Uh, if he and Blake could have had a conversation they would have found many things, I'm sure, they could have spoken about in, in together. Um, and uh, Newton was noted for not only scientific principles, but also experimental principles along the same sort of lines as William Blake. What is beyond? It doesn't stop here. But Blake's vision, I, it seems to me, was somewhat blinkered. So he's put him in a Grecian context, a frozen Grecian context, a captured Grecian context. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think that comes, well, yeah, from the Principia. But the, okay, so if I, if I go back through what you so Newton's writings, alchemical writings, I always think of with Newton, it would be, and so in terms of conversation, that would be interesting. Um, I'm also, Newton's manuscripts are great. Um, I don't know them. I don't know them. I just haven't looked at them, but I'm interested in things like one of his first, maybe his very first notebook um, starts with notes from a treatise on how to draw. Um, and of course the diagrams are freely hand drawn. Um, but there's, there are so many contrasts. So even though Newton writes about theology, he's invested in chronology, isn't he? And that kind of calculating of the positions of the planets and so on to, to tell us what happened. So mathematicizing biblical history in a way that would seem anathema. And I think there is a connection with ingenuity and knack um, and I'm trying to remember when all the manuscript biographies of Newton were published, but my feeling is not yet. Although Henry Pemberton said, erroneously in some ways, that, that Newton was a fan of, of ancient Greek mathematicians like Pappus. But this idea we have now of Newton as a kind of ingenious um, inventor with his water clocks or whatever he's making and somebody who also draws on on the walls of his room he's said to have drawn on the walls of his room I think that fits really well with Blake but we run up on problems don't we so a lot of the interpretations of the water wheels in Jerusalem think that, that they're to do with Blake's attack on induction and then there's the invective against Newton as an experimenter that you get in some of the epigrams, although 
if you think of one like the offensively titled the the cripple every step drudges and labors um it says about newton he's all experiments from last to first doesn't it which always makes me think of deduction rather than induction so i think i think i think blake's relationship to it i don't know what all of you feel i'm really interested in blake's relationship to induction and to ingenuity and it feels to me still like something relatively i don't know i don't know if does everybody accept this about blake does everybody think of an artisanal blake um i, I don't know blake is an experimenter is that is that something we we're happy to to say and to think of i don't know um Anyway, sorry, I, I, I also, you know, thinking back to what you said about the affect of that image, I wonder where, so you, you talked about a kind of amalgam of, you, you said reason, sensation and feeling. And I was just wondering where the sensation and the feeling come from and where they are in the image. Um, but, uh, but anyway, sorry, sorry for talking around so much. I, what you say I find very interesting. So. Okay, the point, I'm sorry, I'll be very brief. Um, my summation of this, Sarah, is that Blake was endeavouring to impose a fourfold vision, not a single vision. Um, Newton is in sleep, Newton is frozen, Newton is solid, Newton is marble-like, and he's surrounded by life. He's surrounded by the growing coral, the sea anemones, uh, what I think of as the Milky Way on the right hand, uh, in the white right hand triangle of the picture, the, the stars, everything's happening around Milton and he's looking down at the floor, you know, the Oscar Wilde thing uh, in the gutter and, so, and Blake was looking at the stars. <sighs> okay, thank you very much, thanks. Um, may we have a, another question? Uh, I have a question. John John. John. Uh, and it's related to what's just been said. It seems to me that the portrait of Newton uh, in the image we've just been discussing is somehow at odds uh, with the later portrayal of Newton as part of the unholy trinity of Newton, Bacon and Locke. I do not regard the picture we've just been looking at as an unsympathetic portrait of Newton. And I was wondering whether um, Blake changed his mind in some way about Newton as doing something I think which is creative and constructive according to my reading of the picture to Blake as being part of this unholy trinity uh, of rationalism. Was there something there that uh, caused Blake to change his mind? I I don't know the answer to that, but I agree with you. I also think there's a change, and I think that the the picture is more positive um, in its representation of Newton. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. I I I'm very happy to for anybody else to chip in if they no one will want to speak about this. One of the things that started to come back in here again, uh, that just kind of looking at it kind of more carefully and, and, that, and maybe it's a, a subtle critique um, is that is that head. I mean, the head really looks like it's just kind of stuck on there. Um, and again, kind of going with the, the, the idea of, a, of that being the capital of a column, you know, it's almost like this kind of marble head has been stuck onto something which as somebody said has been is very much an organic almost like a chunk of marble there and then this sort of rational rational thing which is is, is quite much more carefully pen and inked the hair and the features than the rest of it has been kind of slapped on top of there and I think there's there's something to be said for that as somebody else mentioned this almost like process of of something being raw material being kind of passed through this this rational head and created, you know, cre creating this, um, you know, creating a product at the end. Mm -hmm. But I think there is something about that, um, you know, that the rational and that um, that head as a created thing that is that, that has been stuck onto this natural process. Mm -hmm. 
or some, something like that. That's, it's interesting. It makes me want to, it, you can't see it very well because of how I've um, put my, my own title on top of it. Um, I can't make it come to the front, can I? I was interested in looking at the pencil sketch um, to find out whether the effect that you're observing with the head is something we can also see on the pencil. I don't know what you think about that. I mean, with the pencil, I'm always struck by all these scrolls. Um, as we look at this, you'd have to think about the paper differently, I'd wager, or maybe you wouldn't, maybe you wouldn't agree with me, but it, because it's a line, it's looking more, it's looking flimsier, isn't it? In the pencil sketch, this scroll. Let me get rid of myself too. Um. This is the one that's in the Fitzwilliam. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything they want to, to chip in or to ask. Um. Could, could I ask a question, please? Philomen Verlan. Please. Thank you. I was completely taken by surprise when you all referred to what he is sitting on as a coral reef and that he's somehow underwater. It never, ever, ever occurred to me that that is what could be happening. To me, it looks like a rock that he's sitting on that is covered with lichens, maybe, maybe some interesting fungi. There's nothing marine about this picture. What, what makes you all think that he's underwater and that what he's sitting on is a coral reef? Number one. And number two, there couldn't be anything less geometric than a coral reef, or for that matter, um, a community of lichens on a rock. I think that's a tremendous contrast between what is going on with those dividers on that scroll and what he placed that figure on. Any thoughts? <laughs> May I just say to everyone that Philomain is an oceanographer by profession. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, if, so what, what do these look like to an oceanographer? These things that I called anemones. They look like, they, they, <sighs> They don't look marine. I know, I, I, I thought you're gonna ask me that. And, and I was thinking, what are they in the construct that I have put them in, but, but what they're not is marine. So, yeah, I mean, I, people aren't in agreement about where this is because it's not clear. I think there was a very influential article. I would say it was the one by Joseph Fletcher that's about this as a coralline mass. And I would imagine figures are coming from Buffon's natural history, would it be? There are all sorts of chapters with diagrams from contemporary textbooks, some of which are reprinted in this cyclopedia that as I recall, have got forms similar enough to these to license the comparison being made, but I don't think it's unshakable especially not when queried by an oceanographer. Um, I, yeah, um, people get captivated. And I think it's even on the Tate description, the Tate's description of the image by that um, quotation. Where is it? Um, I'm having to read this from my own screen. Newton's comparison of himself as a boy playing on a seashore, diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell while the great ocean of truth lay undiscovered before me. Um, I have no idea how Blake is supposed to have known about that quotation. 
I don't know anything about the history of it, but I think it's modern interpreters splicing those two together, which makes this idea of it being the, an ocean floor more compelling. But let me let me seed to the floor. I mean, what what do other people think about this being in the ocean? What what do you know or have heard about it? Um, what are your views? Can I say something? Well, I'm invisible. Well, I'm Hi. invisible too. Yeah, okay, Kerry Davis. Um, if it's an underwater scene, is it the first underwater scene in Western art? Can you find any other examples? I'm saying that because um, London Zoo doesn't bring fish and mollusks into its uh, displays until 1853. And if you look in the OED, the very word aquarium doesn't turn up until 1853. So is, this, is he looking at a sea pool at Feltham or Bogner? But then you're suggesting he's looking at Buffon other writers, I don't know how they illustrate um, undersea creatures or undersea life. Um, yeah, that... I, I, as an amateur lichenologist, uh, I'm admiring the lichens on that rock. Hmm. Yeah, see, it looked much more to me like lichens and fungi than it did corals. Yes, they're, they're, those are lichens. Well, I don't, I don't think they're corals. I think it's the seashore of Feltham and what you see in a rock pool at Feltham, maybe when the tide's gone out. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy. You know, there always has to be some re reality. Behind. Blake didn't make things up. I'd, I'd be happier with the rock pool than I would with the coral reef, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't like coral reef myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be in the. the I'd be interested in the natural history of, I mean, I don't even know a working modern understanding of what, <coughs> lichens and fungi and are they, are they also, do they, are they alive? Do they oh, yeah. self-generate? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. So all of that works. So for the pictures, Joe Fletcher's Oceans Growing article is a good one. Um, Thank you. I was, That's really helpful. Uh, no, but I know this is all really, it, it's all helping, so helpful to think about the image in this way. Um, I was talking to Mark Crosby the other day and um, and I haven't been able to follow up what he said, but there's a suggestion by, is it Essek? I, I can't remember, somebody might know, that, that Blake might have printed this as early as 1803, um, which is tantalizing because, so, so you know that, because of all the work that Mark's done on the cottage in Felpham, that Blake appears to have had his rolling press with him and, the idea that this might have actually been produced so near to the seashore you could you, you know you can see how that might be that might be tantalizing um but yeah oh i should also say underwater scenes that's a good question kerry um it mm -hmm. makes me i am thinking about um i won't be able to find it swiftly enough to show everyone i'll just be faffing around but there's a one of the full page designs of eurozone which is earlier has got that picture of a figure. It's the one where you kind of have almost the lines of the waves, you know, cutting the figure. Um, and that's always interested me as another potentially, well, it's certainly watery, it's potentially underwater scene where the figure doesn't appear as if unrefracted or in any way disturbed by the possibility that we might be looking at it through water. Whereas in Eurozen, you do get more of that sense of perception because that's another one of the, I can almost hear the, hear the water. You can see how far my fancy's taken me with this, but it's quite difficult to, to see it in terms of the representation of the figure. So taking it out of the water is, is quite helpful in a way. Um, anyway, thank you for the question. So, uh, Sarah, could I just, just a brief comment? Um, Blake is always sort of introducing us to weird and wonderful worlds that are probably more real in his mind than they are in in the um, in the real world that we live in. Um, so while I've never sort of seen this necessarily as an underwater picture, I've never seen it as any sort of other picture either. Um, it could be under the sea, it could be 
in space, it could be on a mountain top, it could be more or less anywhere. Um, it, I think is Blake sort of um, using his imagination, using um, snippets of knowledge and information, and they all come together into something that is uh, extremely attractive and absolutely fascinating. And the fascinating bit, of course, is the bit we're wrestling with at the moment. Mm. <clears throat> mm. But that idea, I can't, I can't remember whether it was you who talked about subconscious earlier, but, but the idea of all these elements kind of coming together and working themselves out in the, in the process, I, I really do very much like about Blake. And um, I, the idea that you might have been turning over pages and seen a bunch of lines and put it into a picture that's already a collection of lots of different elements does make sense for me in terms mm. of thinking about this. I mean, you mm. don't need the, there are things you can do as a critic that I think are important and hold water, but, but yeah, there's something, yeah, there's something ab about the process, but then again, you know, there are, there are practicing artists. I'm not one on this, on this mm. call who will have ideas about that. I know. Could I add as well? Um, when I, I don't remember where I read, but I definitely read about it being underwater in, in the ocean. Uh, but um, when I read that, I immediately thought of it as being the sea of time and space, not an uh, actual ocean. That's why I never doubted it. So uh, it is being the time, um, sea of time and space. It is in the universe. Uh, it is in the imagina imaginative universe that's being created. That's why I didn't um, think of it as being an actual literal ocean. Yeah, that's, yeah. And that, I wonder if that's making more sense dates wise, because there's not the same suggestion of seashore or underwaterness in the 1795, I don't think, before you've got that sharpening. And if you think about the composition of Milton, Sea of Time of Space, 1804, I don't know. I, I agree that that kind of, that does resonate together definitely yeah if i can uh sarah just thank ramazan for his observation because uh, this uh the comments show to me the the lack of value um of analysis and uh, allowing horizon to run the show um it doesn't matter what blake had for breakfast whether it was in the sea or in space or on a mountain top what does the picture say to me Am I receiving a message from Blake which he's trying to get across to me? Or am I going to analyze it and say, ah, probably had porridge with honey that morning. Or, and using the idea of the fourfold vision, what are the other three visions that come across? Where's the feeling? Where's the intuition? And what sensation does it communicate to me? What is Blake trying to say? not in words, not in reason, but what is Blake trying to get across to me about you? I think that's the wrong sort of question, actually. Oh, um, Blake was a poet, uh, and as we all know for, about poetry, a, poet, a poem is a joint construction between the poet and the reader, in just the same way that a picture such as this is a joint construction between the artist and the viewer. So it's not what Blake is trying to get this across to you. An equally important but different question is, what do you get from the picture? Because it's only the co-construction be between yourself and Blake that gives meaning to the picture. That's funny. I thought that was exactly what I was endeavouring to communicate. Was I misunderstood? Yes. <laughs> yes. It happens all the time. Friends, we're approaching the end of our allotted time. I wonder if there are any final questions anyone might like to ask, perhaps from distant members. Would anyone like to ask a penultimate question? Well, uh, it wouldn't be really a question, but a comment, because um, as I said in the, in the previous meeting that I'm translating Jerusalem, and uh, I remember reading something about the Atlantic deeps that is 
pretty much mentioned um, quite a few times in in the book. So I'm thinking if um, the landscape could be somehow related to the Atlantic deep or not, because I think uh, I was as I was reading uh, Foster Damon's Blake Dictionary, it seems the Atlantic is not the ocean as we know it, but maybe Atlantis, the the lost continent, so maybe a submerged continent. So we are we could be dealing with both the ocean instance and the continental instance mingled. I don't know. What an interesting question. I know I, I have not thought, I don't know anything about Blake and Atlantis. Does anyone? Does anybody here? I just I haven't I haven't plumbed that at all. Um, it's interesting, but please, if anybody does, I I I always welcome. Amela, can you can you give a, a key to where that came from? Well, mm, I I don't know exactly. <laughs> I think I should prepare, I should um, read a bit more to elaborate something um, more complex or deeper, but I remember that I was quite struck by this um, new reading of Atlantic, because he always mentions not Atlantis, but Atlantic. So I think this ambiguity is quite, quite interesting. But at the same time, you cannot really attest that he's referring to the Atlantic continent or not. So I was just thinking because of this interesting discussion about was it in the ocean or not. But I can remember that there's um, th there are many um, references to deeps and deeps and deeps. So um, I was thinking if it was an abyss or if it was the deeps of the ocean and this uh, submerged um, continent, I don't know. Um, because, especially because I'm translating, I'm, I'm always trying to translate the images. And because I've, I've got no uh, a proper or the, the, um, a definitive um, interpretation of it, it makes it really difficult to, to translate this image because I'm not sure if he's referring to a continent or to... Or to there is quite a the long entry in, in the uh, Damon Dictionary. There's quite a long entry about the Atlantic. In yes, the, definitely. Yes, in I remember Damon that. Dictionary. And I found a uh, mention of it in Blake's Visionary Forms Dramatic. Um, it, Blake mentions Atlantic mountains and Atlantis in the French Revolution first, and then mentions it in America and Europe, I guess. but um, I cannot read the details right now. Thank you. There's also a paper I just found online that somebody's written from what looks like 1994 or something. Everyone. But, yeah, it's, go on Tim, sorry. I, I was just going to say we've come to nine o'clock and it's the time to, to draw this wonderful conversation to an end. With everything with Blake, it's so interpretable. We've had so many wonderful interpretations of this, of this picture. And a, a few moments ago, someone said about what is Blake's attitude towards science? And even that, when you think of his great manuscript, The Four Zoas, it ends with the words, sweet science reigns. And so this very beautiful image of Newton, we're not sure ever quite what the interpretation might be. So may we all thank Sarah for a fascinating lecture and to thank all of you for contributing some very wonderful questions. So Sarah, thank you very much indeed. And thank you everyone for joining on Zoom from around the world. And we look forward to seeing you at our next meeting, which will be in January. Um, Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Good night. Thanks everybody. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Sarah. Good very night. Beautiful Thank you. Speech.
Thank you. Good night.